Okay, during the uh, reading of the Torah today, I ran across a commentary in the uh, version that I was I was reading, the new name of God, and I thought I'd share it with you because it kind of ties in with the theme of my sermon. And I'll show you, share with you the uh, commentary. It's Eya, which means I am. When Moses first encountered Elohim in the desert, in the figure of a burning bush, he asked Elohim to reveal his name. But the reply he received seemed only to add to the mystery of who Elohim is. Instead of describing himself as the living Elohim, or the almighty Elohim, or the everlasting Elohim, or the creator Elohim, the Lord instructed Moses saying, I am who I am. This is what you must say to the people of Israel, I am has sent you, me to you. The Hebrew word for I am is Eya, which sounds similar to the word Yahweh, the name for Elohim that appears in the very next sentence. It is a name considered so sacred that even today many Jews do not pronounce it. And when I was visiting Israel, I've seen people turn white when we said we're the congregation of Yahweh. And please don't say that. So, the exact meaning of who I am, who I am, is difficult to know with certainty. The Lord may have been revealing himself not only as the Elohim who has always existed, but also as the Elohim who is always present with his people and who indeed has called them into being. When Yeshua was being attacked by the religious leaders who failed to recognize him as the Messiah, he shocked them, not by claiming to be the Messiah, but by identifying himself with Yahweh, saying, Before Abraham was ever born, I am, John 8, 58. In fact, John's Gospel contains several self-descriptions of Yeshua introduced by the emphatic Greek expression, Ego a me, in Greek means I am. Here's just a few. I am the bread of life, John, uh, in John 6.35. I am the light of the world, John 8.12. Before Abraham was ever born, I am, John 8.58. In Yeshua, we have the richest, most vivid picture of Elohim imaginable. No longer does Elohim seem implacably remote, displeased with the world he has made. Instead, he becomes one of us, sharing our weaknesses and shouldering our burdens. If you were to construct the time machine and then set the location to Jerusalem and the date of the 15th of Tishri in the fall of the year, Nearly 2,000 years ago, you would find yourself in the midst of one of the world's greatest parties. Upon your arrival, your eyes would feast on a great golden city, lit up by the harvest moon. But how could even the most luminous moon make the city and the surrounding hillsides shine so brightly? As you enter the city gates, you make your way through the throng and crowd to discover the source of the light. You are awed by the four giant menorahs that rise above the outside walls of the temple and flood the city with light. Once inside, you hear the people singing and laughing, trumpets blasting, flutes playing, and there's dancing. The leading men of the city are performing dramatic torch dances that will continue throughout the night. Why is everyone so excited? What are they celebrating? If you have done your homework prior to your trip back in time, you would realize that you have walked smack into the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, the most joyous of Israel's feast, also called the Feast of Booths. It is a time to thank Elohim for the harvest, the light and the torches inside the temple remind the party goers of the pillars of fire that led their forefathers through the desert. The lights also remind them of the fire that came down to consume the sacrifices when Solomon dedicated his temple, also on the Feast of Tabernacles, and the glory of the Lord filled it. Now imagine that the seven-day feast is over. 
you are so taken with this light field experience that you can't quite bring yourself to depart. On the very next day, you find yourself listening in on a tense exchange. Some Pharisees are talking to a young rabbi from Galilee. His name is Yeshua, and here's what the rabbi is saying. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have a life filled with light and will never live in the dark. It is a stunning statement, especially right after the Feast of Tabernacles. You realize why the Pharisees are so upset? The conversation continues. There is talk of Abraham, and then you hear it. Yeshua's shocking statement, before Abraham was ever born, I am. The people of Yeshua's day knew exactly who he was claiming to be. Some picked up stones to throw at him while others became believers. 2,000 years later, the choice is ours to make. Reject his claim or embrace him as the great I am, the light of the world, which the darkness cannot overcome. My sermon was uh, continuing on the theme of the light from last Sabbath, reflecting Yahweh and Yeshua's light. We cannot see the light unless it reflects off of something. Yeshua is reflecting Yahweh, his Father. The apostles reflected Yeshua. Haven't you heard, follow me as I followed Yeshua? Well, Yeshua's following Yahweh. John 1, 5, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The New Inter International Version says the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Have you ever been in a room that had no windows, and when you shut off the lights, it was so dark you could feel it? Years ago, uh, we went up vacationing either north Wisconsin or the upper peninsula, where we visited a, uh, I believe it was a copper mine. And they, it was summertime. They made you put on this heavy raincoat like the firemen wear. You have your hat on, and then they take you down into the mine. I don't know how deep we went, but by the time we got down to the bottom, they showed us a looked like a little statue lit up way off in the distance. And they told us. When they shut off all the lights, you could feel the darkness, but except for that little light shining on that statue. And they said that statue was something like 20 or 30 feet high. That's how big the, the mine was. The darkness, you, you could feel it when they shut the light off. It's our human nature to fear darkness. Some will say that they don't fear the darkness, but just try to navigate in a strange room with no light. Is it not fear that assails you, that lost feeling? We don't, like, we don't like that. We don't know what we may bump into. We don't have control of the situation when we are in that kind of a position. We like to think that we are in control. On the other hand, in this verse, John says, the light shines in the dark. This statement is even more exciting when we finish it with, and the dark has never extinguished it. You can take a light into a dark room, like I mentioned, and you will find that no matter where the room, where in the room you put the light, or no matter how small this light is, the <coughs> darkness cannot hide it. You cannot put so much more darkness in it that you won't see the light. It never will happen. It's like putting red pigments into a base of white paint. No matter how much more white you put in it, the paint is no longer pure white. Once light enters a dark room, it can be seen by all. Of course, we know that this verse is not talking about a literal light in a literal darkness. This verse is right on the heels of verse 1 through 4. And what is John chapter 1? Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim. The Word was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. 
All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse four, these four verses, plus the fifth, that one I read earlier, gives us these three formulas, which will be subtitles of this sermon, with two main points. The light equals the word. There's not much discussion here since verse 1 through 4 tells us this much. The next two points are that verse 5 is talking about when John says the light shines in the dark, and the dark has never extinguished it. John 1, 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There have been thousands and millions and billions of books written in the world since man picked up a stick and started drawing in the clay tablets. There are not many books around from that era. But from Genesis to Revelation, there is not one book that has surpassed this popularity, popularity and long evity. I am years ago, no, not, yeah, kind of years ago, uh, I read it, the book series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, the Left Behind series. And these books were, was interesting sci-fi to me, it was loosely based on the scripture. And when these books started coming out, there was a rush to read them. I even heard stories of unsaved people reading the books and seeking someone to lead them into salvation. Since 9-11, the book series was taken off and then a new book is released and it was printed in the millions and still not enough books were made, to, made it to the market. But this still does not compare to the word of Yahweh. 20 years later, Left Behind series are all but a memory. The Bible will still be number one seller. Now that's an example of the light in a dark room. No matter how hard Satan tries, no matter how hard the world tries, this light will not be hid. Since the beginning of time when Yahweh had put his light into the world, in verse 1 of the Genesis, we see that right up until into today, Yahweh's light or presence has not been extinguished. The evidence of Yahweh's handiwork is everywhere. You cannot miss it. That is why I'm so surprised that most scientists are not believers. I guess they choose to be in the lost state they're in. What has been your choice? Do you think all of this Yeshua, son of Yahweh stuff is foolishness? Paul had an answer for you in that. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, For the preaching of the stake is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of Yahweh. The light we shine as believers has and will not be snuffed out. Because it is Yahweh's light reflected. We try to follow Yeshua who followed Yahweh. His light becomes part of our light. People see us and we stand out. They notice it. In the second book of the Bible, Yahweh gives us an excellent example of his purpose for the light. Exodus 13, 21. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Yahweh had to physically lead the Israelites through the desert. Why? Because of two reasons. They really didn't know where they were going. Remember, they had been enslaved for 400 years. And you're talking about people who have never been anywhere except home in the mud pit to make bricks. <coughs> so they had no idea where they were going, and Rand McNally wasn't born yet. Second reason, Yahweh wanted them to get used to following his lead. He knew life in the new world was going to start out tough, and he wanted them to realize he was the answer to their problems and their obstacles. 
Do we always recognize that today? Do you, when an obstacle presents itself, always look at Yahweh and say, it's in your hands? Or do you say to Yahweh, why did you do this? Or why did you let this happen? In turn, making Yahweh an obstacle to your growth. Now back to the Israelites following the history of these people, and you will find that their lives were so messed up at times that they considered Yahweh an obstacle. How many of us do that? How many often, how often do we start a project and try all the things we know how to do, and when it fails, then we call on Yahweh? rather than just put Yahweh in the loop at the very beginning. I saw a lot of people that thought Yahweh was the reason for their plight. And I saw a lot of people that thought they couldn't do better because Yahweh did not approve of what they wanted to do. They thought Yahweh was an obstacle to what their goals were in life. Yahweh was in their way instead of being the way. When I discovered Yahweh's desire for Tanya and I, I obeyed. I do not yet know the entire plan he has for me. But right now I am in his will and that to me is all that matters. How many of you can say that? Are you in Yahweh's will right now? Are you seeking Yahweh's guidance right now? And where will you find Yahweh's will? And where will you find Yahweh's guidance? In his Bible. People will not read it. I can't understand it. How can you not understand anything when you don't even try to read it? You don't even try. Get a version you can understand. Start the simple one and work your way up as you study. Are you asking Yahweh to bless what you are doing on your own? We should always ask Yahweh to help us to do what He is blessing, rather than bless what we are doing. Some of you are probably saying, okay, I've heard preachers all my life telling me how bad I am and how I need to change, but not many offer me the materials I need to use to make those changes. Not many tell me how. Well, the light equals the word in a dark heart or the word in a dark life. This will help us to live holy lives. You see, when you accept Yeshua Messiah into your mind and heart, the first time there's a lot of light flashed in at once. Sometimes it's a, it will last a long time. Wow, I just got baptized. I understand. I'm going to be baptized. I get baptized. Yes, I'm following you. But for some, it's just a little while. Like until they leave the meeting and enter again into the world they live in. I was like that at once. I was good in church and maybe all day Monday and Tuesday rolled around and I would slide back into the ways that that would set me up for failure. I am not a failure. I realize that as in a dark room, the more light you have, the brighter it is, the more you can see and understand. This can best be described with yet another formula. I like math. I times L equals H. Intensity times the light equals holiness. How did I ever come to this tendency to just float through the week and get spiritually fed on Sabbath? I learned to feed myself. I started reading the Word, which equals the light's first formula. The light equals the Word. Praying daily. I would sit down early in the morning and pray for understanding. Open the Word of Yahweh and read. What do you want me to see? What do you want me to understand? You 
even looking back, the more you read the scriptures, you think, how did I miss that? I know more today than I did back then. How did I miss that? How did we miss knowing that it was important to know Yeshua and Yahweh? How did we miss that? And it's right there all the time. Then I, and now, I have my little place of prayer. A place I can go to to be alone with Yahweh. That does not have to be a physical place. It is a place in your mind. You can pray there anytime you want. Yahweh and Yeshua is in you. You can talk to him all the time. Tell him what's going on. Having a, an, a relationship with them. A place that offers little of any distractions. That is place, the place in your mind and heart where Yeshua lives. The problem with most believers is that they have Yeshua in their mind and hearts, but they have put him in a room and they close the door only to open it when they are in trouble. What better source of light than the light of the world? John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil, New International Version. As you read the word and apply what you read, the light gets brighter in your dark heart. You start reflecting more. As you study the word and follow Yeshua's footsteps, the light fills in all those little dark corners of your mind. Yeshua's light gets brighter, so you have the intensity part of the formula. I found that the more I love Yeshua, like I love my wife, the less I let myself be tempted. I love Yeshua because he is the word and I try hard to put the word in my heart by following what he says. I don't like the phrase to hide the word in my heart. I want to put it there to share with others and to have it ready and in the forefront to use when I need it. We put it into our hearts and minds to give us the light to share not to keep to ourselves. Remember the story about the servant who knew his master and he hid the money? That's how he came back and the master was angry. He didn't share it. He didn't increase what he had. When you love someone, you want to know all you can about that person. Yeah. Loving Yeshua is no different. You need to study him. And the only place to do that is in the Bible the word. John, 1 John 5 verse 3, for this is the love of Yahweh that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 2, by this we know that we love the children of Yahweh when we love Yahweh and keep his commandments. 1 John 3 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 2, 3, And that hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Revelation 14, 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Yahweh and the faith of Yeshua. 2 Timothy 2:15. Study to show thyself approved unto Yahweh, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I have a hard time memorizing anything, but I have found that if I study the word long enough and often enough, memorization comes naturally. Even if someone says, well, the Bible says this, and you, you know you read the Bible, and I don't remember seeing that, or reading that. So then you can say, well, where exactly did you see that in the Bible? If you never read the Bible, you just accept what the guy says. 
We need to be reading the Bible in order to put the light in our hearts and minds. We don't want darkness there. And I need to say this. Don't get hung up on the versions of the Bible that you use. I, I like three or four ver different versions. I have at least 12 different versions, if not more, at my house. My favorite beginning Bible was the NIV. It was easy to read, easy to understand. Of course, the King James is the standard most people use. Yahweh's Word, we have the, that copy here. And for my birthday, I just got the scriptures by the Institute of Scripture Research. That was cool. I'm starting to read that one from front to back. I have seen believers give up reading because someone in the church told them there was only one version of the Bible. Believe me, the King James Version is a translation also. I don't think all of us can read Greek. And if you want to get technical, you need to learn because the original manuscripts was not the King James Version. Now, as you grow in Messiah, you'll find one that is much easier for you to use. Start there. If you have to struggle to understand what you are reading, then you are going to lose interest. Then reading the Bible becomes a chore. Then you just quit reading. So start off with something that is easy to understand for you. If you're not sure of the authenticity of your choice, ask the pastor or an elder in the church who will make sure that you're not reading garbage. My prayer is this, that all believers everywhere will start illuminating their life or their hearts with the light of the word, reflecting Yeshua, because as you take in this light, the word, the world will see you. You will stand out. They will recognize you as of that light. Some may ridicule you, some may not. But all will not be able to hide that light, and the darkness has never and will never extinguish it. And let me say this, if you don't now, plan a time each day where you sit down with the word of Yahweh. Maybe you could only carve out five minutes tomorrow. It's a start. When your body is hungry, you stop what you're doing and find something to eat, right? What if I told you your spirit is starving when you neglect to study Yahweh's word? Yeah. I'm not perfect. I could spend more time with Yahweh and read his word, but in order for us to grow, we need to spend time at the feet of the master. Now, maybe you were saved once, but for some reason, you let Satan take over in some areas of your life. You need to come back to Yahweh and give that area of your life back to Yeshua. Or, if you're a visitor and you want to make our church your church, you may also come here and be blessed by belonging to a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. Whatever your need is today, come and let Yahweh and Yeshua help you. We will be here to help you find your way. And may Yahweh bless you in your search.